Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations, where we talk about mental health, adversity, spirituality, and societal issues. I'm your host, Bertan Dandia. This week's episode, prepare to be mesmerized as we dive into the captivating world of Sufism with an extraordinary guest who has truly embraced its profound teachings in every aspect of her life. In this special episode, I sit down with Dr. Zoha Fazel, a living embodiment of Sufi wisdom, to explore her awe-inspiring journey on the mystical path. Dr. Fazel shares her transformative adventure, which commenced with an encounter that forever changed the trajectory of her existence. From the very first steps, the all-encompassing love and boundless wisdom of Sufism illuminated her soul, leading her to embark on a quest of self-discovery and enlightenment. Throughout this riveting conversation, Dr. Fazel reveals how she integrated the core principles of Sufism into her daily life. Love, compassion, and unity became her guiding beacons, forging powerful connection with people from all walks of life. Prepare to be inspired as she shares profound tales of healing broken hearts, mending broken spirits, and bridging divides with the strength of love and understanding. Furthermore, this episode uncovers the power of remembrance, a cornerstone of Sufi devotion. Dr. Fazel shares the profound impact of immersing herself in the repetition of sacred words, leading her to unparalleled spiritual bliss. As our conversation unfolds, we witness how the teachings of Sufism have rippled outwards, leaving an indelible mark on the lives of countless individuals. Dr. Fazel has become a beacon of hope and positivity, touching her hearts and souls across the globe. Her unwavering dedication to service, kindness, and understanding has sparked a movement of love that knows no bounds. Dr. Fazel started her spiritual studies and practices early with her grandfather. As a young adult, she trained with many spiritual masters to develop self-awareness. Also, she learned about helping others heal through their spiritual energy, discovering the subconscious programming that holds them back and learning to change it and strengthen their connection with their higher power. She expanded these teachings by going through traditional psychology education methods and received her doctorate in psychology, behavioral analysis, and metacognition. She now has more than 20 years of experience in the field. These skills in her spiritual training guide her in her sessions today. For many years, she practiced traditional therapy with her clients and noticed they needed to progress faster than she knew they had the potential to do. Instinctively and through her personal experiences with spiritual practices, she knew therapy alone might not make the impact her clients desired or needed. This propelled her to educate herself on spiritual and energetic modalities further. When she started implementing these methods, she saw huge shifts. Her passion is to combine her academic and spiritual backgrounds to help people experience and discover their inner light and know the miracles they truly are. Please find Dr. Fazel on her website at www.drzoa.com. And please leave a review or comments in the comment section for this podcast or subscribe to the podcast on any platform that you listen to the podcast on, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. All right, Dr. Fazel, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited about the conversation we're going to have and uh, we been able to connect offline and and chat through some of your stories and your journey. And I'm really excited to to have the ability to talk through it today in the episode. But before we get started, I wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the listeners and uh, let us know a little bit about what it is that you do and uh, where you're based. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me, trusting me to enter into your space. Um, I am in California, Southern California, to be exact. And um, as far as the career, I am a, a mental health provider. I'm a psychologist. Great. And uh, what got you into 
you know, this field and wanting to become a psychologist and how has your journey evolved as a psychologist? Well, I think I've always kind of internally known that I was going to be a psychologist. I didn't have the language for it. I didn't know that that's what they called it. Um, but I remember when I was very small, like maybe five years old, my grandfather and I used to hang out together and I would tell him to, you know, let's get together. I'm, I'm originally from Iran. I don't know if I said that earlier or not, but um, we would get together and I would tell him, you know, sit down, gossip with me. And the word gossip in Farsi means something totally different than it does in English. But basically where let's chat, let's chat our lives, you know, tell me about your problems type thing. And he would giggle and he would tell me, you know, a made up story or whatever that was going on. And I would, quote, give him advice on what to do. Um, so I've kind of always internally known that I like talking to people and hearing their stories and hearing what makes them tick and kind of guide them. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not even really sure if that's what we call, guide. you know, as a mental health provider, we don't really guide. We just bring you back to who you truly are on the inside and just kind of help you um, process and be your witness is what it is. That's what I like to think of it when I um, think of um, what I do. Um, but it all started with my grandfather, I think, because he was very much a man of, um, he, you know, was a religious man, but more of a spiritual type where he incorporated his spirituality with his religion to guide him. And he was an educator. So I think I just kind of witnessed him and kind of got, you know, went from there. Yeah. Yeah. And how was it? Like, I know we talked about the whole notion of you growing up in Iran and, you know, there's a lot going on there right now. And, you know, when you and I connected offline, you obviously can't speak to what's, what are some of the struggles with the people that are living there right now? But you definitely have some exposure from your earlier years. Why do you think there's so much polarity and, and disconnect between the people there and, and all this violence? And yeah, like what's, what do you think that's, where is that coming from? Well, you know, I left when I was really young, so I can't really speak to their experience today. Um, yeah. I left when I was eight or nine years old. It was the beginning of the Islamic Republic. And I remember, you know, we went from the regime where Shah allowed a lot of freedoms. And, um, you know, there was issues. I'm sure there were otherwise people wouldn't have had an uprising. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, one day where the women are wearing, you know, a modern clothes and then the next day everybody's wearing like you know the the big veils and i guess what they call a burqa or a rusari um and um you know wearing almost like we all had to wear uniforms and it was like these long dark looking uniforms that all the girls had to wear and schools became all either men or you know, boys or girls so there was no mix anymore um and of course i was young so I'm sure even if I, I can't even remember ever a time that there was a mix, if there even was ever a mix. Uh, but I remember everything became so regimented and, um, you know, we started learning about the Quran, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't really think that that was part of the curriculum really before. Perhaps it was, um, you know, a choice. But now that was a part of a daily thing, even as early as like, say, first grade. That even though we couldn't even read really, um, we were, you know, hearing about it. And that was part of our daily um, things that we did. And like I said, I left when I was maybe like in third or fourth grade. So yeah. I wasn't there long enough to see all the struggles that the women have gone through to, as of today. Um, but I suspect, and I've traveled a couple of times back. So I, I remember I would go back and, you know, you hear the call to prayer. And for me, it was like this beautiful thing. And, you know, it would bring tears to, you know, because you're hearing this beautiful. And I remember the people that I would walk with would always say, what? That that brought you to tears? Like for them, they were so desensitized. Like it didn't mean the same things that it did for me. Yeah. For them, yeah. it was like, you know, the call to torture maybe. I don't know. But that's what it felt like. 
And so it's just the, the way the control is. And I'm sure over a time period, it comes to a head and it becomes, you know, a form of violence, especially when, you know, women are beaten or not wearing their hijab a certain way or whatever. I, I do really feel like religion or, you know, your connection with God is a personal thing, not one that should be forced upon you because otherwise that relationship becomes toxic. And I remember even leaving Iran and because all this stuff was forced upon us. And, you know, I remember leaving and thinking, what kind of God would think a woman is less than a man? We're the ones that give birth. And I remember this clearly. I was like eight years old. Remember thinking these things right. that, you know, we clearly give birth. So without us, there would be no human race. And, um, we're the ones that like take care of the children and yet we're less. I, don't, I just don't understand why God would create a, a, a group of us that wouldn't be equal because I didn't fully understand. And it was because what I had just seen in the environment. So imagine if you, if I had stayed there and I was in that environment year after year, day after day, this kind of stuff being, you know, put inside you and your subconscious mind what that would create. And the new generation isn't like even us back in the day. The new generation has access to technology and all the things that they see. And they're like, well, how, why are we any different? And so the right. girls right. today are so much more, you know, apt to get out there. And like, like I said, in this case, I don't know if we even wanted to call it a revolution, but basically in essence, it started by women, girls, teenage yeah. girls. So um, but much more than that, I can't really speak to because I haven't been there. I haven't been in their environment. I don't know what kind of pressures they have. So to say like why it's happening, I really don't know. Right. But I like to think of it as a woman giving birth where pressure builds and, you know, you go through a lot of stress and then new life is given. So mm -hmm. perhaps this is their new life that's coming. God willing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think uh, there's, I uh, there's an aspect anytime there things need to be compulsed or, or pushed on people, it often leads to tyranny. And that's where you're seeing the tyrannical approach there. But in the face of tyranny, you, you kind of fight for your freedom. And that's where you're seeing a lot of the women, as you mentioned, fighting for their freedom. But there's a lot of trauma there too, right? And as you mentioned, when people would hear that call to prayer, there was that traumatic response to it and i think that a lot of people associate the tyranny for, as coming from god rather than just the the perhaps the the evil in people themselves right that need for power is one of the the sins right and and people often associate that with god but i think there is something there and and i appreciate you sharing at least your experience and what you're seeing with the women um, fighting back for their freedom. How did that in any way shape how you started to approach therapy? Like how did your journey then evolve over the years? Because I know when we spoke offline, you've kind of taken a bit of a different approach and that required you to do a lot of self-reflecting. Well, so for me, like I said, when I came from Iran, I kind of completely disconnected. Like, I want to have nothing to do with almost that country, that religion, like, you know, I kind of immersed myself in the American culture. And then I think over time, I realized that I'm not fully of this place either. Like, yeah. I felt somewhat disconnected here, even though we're a complete melting pot. Like, there's a lot of different cultures and um, different things that, that I've different people that I've met here, but still I didn't feel like that place that I could call home. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think really what was missing was the whole concept of God for me. Mm -hmm. And I lived with an American family. I don't know if I told you this before, but I lived with an American family and I started going to church with them. And so kind of got exposed to Christianity and Jesus and, you know, all of those things as well. So it was like, is it this? Is it that? I did like the fact that their God, if we could even call it that in my own, um, you know, um, immature mind, it felt like it was a different God, but um, felt more loving. 
It's like, you know, he'll he'll accept you as long as you say, you know, I accept you. Right. right. So that was kind of uh, a kind of a difference between my own religion and the Christian religion. And um, but, you know, over time, I just kind of let that go until the day that I met my master. You and I talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew. Let me clarify the word master, because for a lot of people, the word, you know, words have meanings and it matters how it comes across. And so the word master just means someone who has mastered that particular thing that they're studying, right? Um, not that he is my master or somehow that I am a slave to him. Right. But um, I remember, um, you know, at that point, my whole, my mom had come from Iran and we were living in America and uh, I was working. I was probably like 16, 17 years old, come home one evening and uh find my there's like some party or something at my house and I remember they're all sitting in the dark chanting and I remember thinking to myself what are they doing why are they in the dark like is this some sort of satanic ritual or something and but then I realized that they're actually chanting names of God and you know I'm in the Muslim religion if you look through the Quran um God has different names for the different qualities that he has, like, you know, uh, kind, loving, um, masterful. So those are the different names that, you know, they're so they yeah, right. different yeah. names. Exactly. So yeah. they were yeah. chanting those names. And I'm just, I, when the lights came on, I remember almost seeing no one but this one man. Like you see everybody, but this particular man, for whatever reason, caught my attention. Like his eyes seemed brighter. His face looked lit up. I don't know what it was about him, but I just kept feeling drawn to him. And he was older. He was probably in his maybe 80s. And I went and sat next to him and we just kind of started chatting. And there was another younger man, like maybe 50, um, talking about God and just kind of giving a sermon almost, right? Mm -hmm. And um, everybody was drawn to him, asking him questions. But for whatever reason, I wanted to be close to this older man. And um, so I asked him a couple questions, like, what's going on here and everything? And asked him about who, what the person that was talking. And I said, I don't know what it is about you. You feel like, cozy. <laughs> I don't know what else. Another word for that. I felt I feel connected to you. Like, I've met you somewhere before. And as the young man um, was still speaking and every person that was there obviously knew he was the quote lead in the program, um, my master turned to me and said, ah, your heart found the master. And I didn't even know what that meant, but this basically this was a Sufi circle is what it was. Yeah. And yeah. they were there to talk about like, you know, Ruby, the poetry and, um, the love for God and um, basically there to get what we call zikr, which is um, your meditative le a a word that they give you. But you have to be chosen. You can't just um, go over there and request for one, right? You have to show that you're ready, that you're spiritually ready. And my master basically took my hand, took me into the room and gave me a zikr because he said that I was ready. And all these older people were like, what? Wait a minute. We, we came to this thing and we've come for weeks and weeks. And she, she just showed up. She doesn't even know what the thing is. She's the one that's ready. And he said, she chose me. I didn't choose her. She knew. She has a knowing. So she's ready. And that's how my, um, I didn't even know what was happening. I didn't even know what a zig was. Yeah. I've always yeah. had a, a love for God, right? I just didn't know how to connect that relationship. And through that experience, I started my practice and my meditation and my zikr and, you know, kind of, I wasn't even one that prayed. I didn't even know the different, like, you know, the five times of prayer as a Muslim. I didn't even know any of that. And here I was yeah. getting the zikr. And so... Through that, I did learn, I, I worked with my master and realized that, you know, having a relationship with God isn't a religion. It is a practice. It is a daily connection. It is a relationship. Mm -hmm. It is a relationship with self and the divine and the divine within us. 
So it isn't something that, you know, I have to go searching out there for, or I just do this practice. There's a lot of people that pray five times a day and they don't even know what they're doing. Like they're just doing the, the movements, right? But they're not really connecting regularly. And so from there, I kind of went into maybe trying to decide what the, the, the scientific background of this thing, right? Yeah. Which is what led me into psychology and a little bit more metaphysical type stuff and, you know, quantum physics and so learning about those things. And now, um, instead of just being a psychologist that does mental health, you know, the traditional method, I tried to combine those two together because I really feel like it makes a difference. We are not just this physical body or this mind or these emotions. We are a spiritual being having a human experience. So how can you disconnect those two and, you know, have someone in your office and say, all right, tell me about your day. And let's just keep it at this surface level when I know there's something more that I can give them or connect them to. And, and I'm not for everybody. Those that come to see me know that that is my, that's how I work. And so if they're ready, that that's, they take that plunge. And if they're not, they'll go find a traditional type of mental health provider that does work surface level. Right, right. Well, yeah, well, thank you for sharing all that. And I think, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely come back to that aspect, but I just want to give you also some space and perhaps for the listeners too, if you're able to, maybe at a high level, I know Sufism is fairly complicated and it's not very straightforward. Um, and then there's obviously a lot of misinformation out there as well. But are you able to kind of walk us through what Sufism is and, and how it may differ from traditional Islam? And perhaps there's this whole notion of mysticism involved in there too, right? That I don't think everyone fully appreciates. So absolutely. I can't give you, I'm, I'm not an expert. I can just yeah. give you what my experiences have been, right? And remember, this is an experience of, and basically an American girl coming into contact with that and what we had available to us here. I'm sure there are many Sufis around the world in Turkey and in the Middle East and other places that may be able to give you more information. So I'll just speak to my own experience. For me, the way that I understood it and like I said, I always see um, the religious aspect, like, you know, the prayer, the fasting, the commandments, all of that, as a form of your discipline. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you want to utilize that discipline is because you're trying to discipline the mind, right? So my, um, my teacher would always say that the conscious mind, and I'll use terminology that I understand now, even though he may have not said it that way. That your conscious mind is the mind that you think with, is the ego, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's there to protect you. Uh, otherwise, uh, people would, he would use, he would say, if people actually, you took away their ego from the beginning when they're not ready and they haven't worked on it, they would go sit at the grave, wait to die. They wouldn't yeah. even fight for life, right? Because they now know that, you know, the connection would be way too much and they wouldn't be ready. So the ego is there, your, your conscious mind is there to guide you. But the problem is, is that we have created the conscious mind and we've developed the conscious mind, which is the mind that you and I use every day to do work or whatever. Um, and they, we've made that the master, mm -hmm. where that's not the master. The master is something greater, something bigger. Um, you may call it God, you may call it the subconscious mind, you may call it by a lot of different names, but it's just something that's bigger than us. It's right. basically, in essence, what created us. It's the voice that comes out of my mouth right now. It's what it's the thing that sees through my eyes. It's the one that created my heart. It is who I truly am, right? It's the I am. Right. Um, but most people are disconnected from that. They don't know who they are. They think they're their name. They think they're their career. They think they're their whatever they do in this life, right? right. But, we, but who are you is the real question. And to me, that's what Sufism has given me. It's that questioning of who really am I and sitting quietly and going in deeper and figuring out that I am. Have I 
completely let go of the ego and now allowing, you know, the God within me, I guess, is the, however you want to explain that, to take over. Maybe not 100%, but I'm striving. At least I have that connection. And that's what Sufi has given me. Mm-hmm. I remember my teacher would say, you know, as a Sufi, um, so the Jewish religion gave us the discipline. Right. And the Christian religion gave us the heart. And the Muslim religion, practiced correctly, is the connection between the heart and the mind. Mm. And so that's what we're striving for. We're connecting the mind and the heart. The heart being where God lives and the mind being the conscious mind that kind of just drives you, right? Right. Um, right. To get to where you need to be. But that, like I said, that it is a um, spiritual experience in a human body. So that's what Sufism really means to me. It is much deeper than that, but that's how I understood it. Yeah, yeah, no, I thank you for walking us through that. And I think it's so important that you broke it down between the heart and the mind. And I think that's where uh, Descartes got it wrong, where he was almost like, I think, therefore I am. And that's only part of the picture. There's that huge component of the heart. And I think for me, the way I've understood Sufism is also this, um, and, and you've kind of alluded to it, but there's that independent, private relationship you have with the source, with God, or, or whatever people want to call it. It's having that private connection. And, you know, I think a lot of the times people get caught up in how is my outwardly actions, external actions appearing to others? And they tend to get caught up in that. And to me, that's almost a form of worshiping idols in a way, because you're, you're worried about how other people are perceiving your actions rather than, again, going back to that internal connection you have with the creator. And that, for me, at least looking at Sufism has been very appealing because it comes back to very much personal attachment. And I think that's where I struggled as a child too, because there was so much emphasis on doing these actions and being judged by others and always wondering, like, as you mentioned early on, is like, why are people going to judge me? Like, this doesn't seem to make sense. And as a child, it was hard to formulate it. But as I've kind of gotten older and gone through certain experiences, especially with my ego, I've been able to realize that it is everyone's on their own journey of self mastery and who knows what the right answer is, but something inside of me tells me what the right answer is. And that's finding that deeper connection. Absolutely. There's this beautiful saying um, that they say, God wanted to ask the mountains, let me be there. Let me be part of you. And the mountain's like, no, 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 I don't want that responsibility. (laughs) You know, ask the sky, no, 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 I don't want that responsibility. But the human heart accepted that challenge. And and that's where God resides. And so that's why they say always go back to the self and go into your heart and just really listen to that. And that doesn't always mean like just do whatever you want. Um, It's that internal knowing. I think sometimes people get that confused. Like, you know... Don't God, I'm just going to do what I want. Like that, as if, as if that's what love is, but yeah. really it's that, it's that inner knowing with that discipline of the mind. Yes. And yes. you got to, like you said, not you ride the donkey, not the donkey rides you. And so like, if we were to call the conscious mind, quote, the donkey, <laughs> um, it's, it's there to serve you. You're not there to serve it. And that's what you're talking about when it came to that whole you know, looking out and seeing what everybody else is saying and what else everybody else thinks you should be doing, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, to your point, I think the discipline allows us to gain that deeper level of self-awareness. I think through discipline, you're not being pushed and pulled in different directions because, you know, that's something I've experienced. There's so many distractions, so many temptations around us that take away our attention and it's those acts of discipline are really what allow us to come back to ourselves 
and have that deeper level of focus and direct our attention it, it just straight even to our heart and often we we get caught up in all these uh, distractions that prevent us from just focusing on our hearts so so it's so crucial to be aware of looking at these you know often people just i think out of arrogance perhaps feel like oh i'm i don't need to practice this i don't need to do this and you know like there's that trauma that we talked about earlier too there's that sense of trauma where people feel like it's being forced on them so they want to fight back and not do it and um, i think it's recognizing perhaps that those acts are more for your own good and for your own discipline and, and not losing sight of that absolutely and you know i always uh, think of it this way yes you can do it on your own you don't have to connect nobody's mm -hmm. forcing you this is the one good thing about our god he, he never forces you right and then to say it even like that makes it sound like God is somehow separate from us. That's a deeper, bigger topic. Yeah. But nobody is forcing you. You can do this by yourself as the small human self that you are, right? It'll just be harder. Why not connect and, and expand and become bigger? And, you know, therefore, all the human beings of the world become hands of God for you. So really what you're doing is you're disconnecting yourself from that bigger um, thing that could support you and help you and just do it by yourself. Nobody's right. stopping you. Right. That's what you want to do. Just yeah. gonna be harder yeah. and we'll take one. Right. Right. And that's the whole notion of being able to tap into your higher self that people talk about. And, and, you know, it sounds like woo woo -y and, and people don't really grasp that concept. But for me, I think that's how I interpret it is that, being able to connect with your higher self, that inner wisdom. And when you really listen to it, it can be so powerful. Um, at least I've experienced that. And uh, yeah, there's something definitely there. So I guess with your practice now, since you've kind of incorporated that, do you mind sharing what that looks like? Because, you know, a lot of people, to your point earlier, you know, when it comes to mental health, there's like certain prescriptions you can give or you can set some goals with clients. But how is the work you're doing different from that? So, um, you know, of course, we do the typical talk therapy and all of that. You know, like when you come into session, of course, I have to hear your story. You tell me what's going on and we'll process some of that information. I might give some cognitive behavioral therapy type stuff or behavioral approaches to things. But then I will take you deeper. So we will go through the meditative process and I will connect you. So basically walking you through being able to get there, right? And getting into that deeper space as to asking those questions of why and letting go of some of the trauma, some of the, um, not just religious trauma, but just any trauma that you might have and uh, reprogramming in essence. Because what happens is, as, as children, we get programmed a certain way by our parents, our teachers, our culture, and um, some of that, because we are uh, of an immature mind, may get interpreted a different way. You see, children are in what we call theta brainwaves, which is closest to that subconscious mind or closest to God, or however your mind can wrap its, you know, its head around that. Um, and so they just absorb, they just absorb and they absorb. And that kind of becomes the foundation of who we are. And then as older people, we are working off of these old, you know, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, you know, programs or mentalities that may not serve us anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the deeper connection is important to really figure out who you are and that potential that you have. Um, so that's what we do in, in session. We'll go in, we'll talk about the pain, we'll, but in a meditative state where you're deeper, you're closer, and you can answer your own question. And through, um, you know, prayer, energy, healing, however you want to see it, we remove some of those old things and replace it with who you want to be or who you think you, you are and who you God intended you to be. You see, we are limitless. We are, we are not just this body. We are not just these thoughts. We are not just these emotions. We are limitless. 
my teacher used to say, think of yourself as a drop of water that is connected to the ocean. Yeah. But you still yeah. have the potential of the ocean. Mm -hmm. But if you only see yourself as a droplet, you're never going to get anywhere. Once connected, you become the ocean. And therefore, that potentiality becomes available to you to do whatever it is that you came here to do. Yeah. That, that we came here for as God in a body. And that's like the most potent way that I can say that, right? Uh, to experience God's love for, for himself. Mm -hmm. And that's who we are. And so that's our potential. And so we play small a lot of times. And so in that session, now different people come to me with different understandings of that. And I meet them where they are and try to help them get there. For them, it may be like, I'm having anxiety. How do I overcome that? And so that's what we work on. And some other people come in and they're like, okay, I want to take it to the next level. I want that potential that you're talking about. And so we might work a little deeper. So really, I'm trying to meet people where they're at and what, what they need. And so we'll go there. And to tell you that I don't even feel like I do the work. It's really the person doing the work. And I, again, become their witness. I just maybe guide them through that process and allow the spirit to work through me to say what they need to hear, allow spirit to work through me to take them to where they need to go um, and just have to trust that. Sometimes it's hard for me. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> the ego gets in the way and yeah. I'm like, come on, I really want them to. But sometimes you need to go through a certain place to get to where you need to go. And it may be a bumpy ride for a little while. Mm -hmm. yeah and everyone's well, journey is different right so and uh how they get there you never know uh, uh yeah i think when you were saying that that Rumi saying came up for me i think it's you're not a drop in the ocean you're the entire ocean in a drop uh, as you alluded to and and i read somewhere that you know even with god he doesn't want he has so much love for us that he doesn't want to receive that love in return. He just wants to us to give that love to ourselves and others around us. And to me, that is probably the most profound thing because we get so caught up in it that we're either disconnected from other people or we just don't have that sense of love for ourselves. And that's where we end up getting lost. And as soon as you're able to start by giving that to yourself you're just in a better state and then you're able to have that abundant flow of love that you can also share with others and if everyone just focused on that alone the world would be a better place and that's something i try to remind myself even when people do hurtful things or perhaps they do something that i don't agree with it's looking at it from a place of compassion and love and understanding that maybe they are well-intentioned or maybe they have their own trauma they're dealing with or they're just lost and how can i have that empathy and compassion for them and hopefully and, and, and that's why that practice that daily practice is important you see mm -hmm. because like you said it's a busy place you get yeah. distracted your job your children your life just takes over if you don't have that daily practice, I call it meeting the self. If you don't go coffee with yourself daily, and I don't mean actual coffee, but like, yeah. you know, an internal coffee, um, you're going to forget. You're going to start acting like, you know, everybody else. And life kind of just takes you over. And in essence, you become asleep again. Or as mm -hmm. I like to call it, become an animal. <laughs> like the difference between us and animals is nothing except for the frontal lobe and the fact that we connect regularly. If we can't do that, there is no difference between what every other animal on this planet does and what we're doing. So in order not to forget and in order to remember what we're doing here and remember who we truly are, you need that daily practice. Otherwise, yeah, you're not yeah. going to have those thoughtful moments where you're like, you're having a moment right now. You're going to get all sucked into their whatever. And then the, the drama starts and then the anger starts. And then, you know, you're going down the rabbit hole. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that's where yes. the whole idea coming full circle of those practices of discipline are so important because those are the practices that bring us 
back to ourselves, right? And and otherwise, we're constantly inundated with things and and constantly distracted. Now, just kind of one of the things that comes up for me because a lot of people do get this. Uh, I guess are somewhat have this aversion to the whole notion of God. And for some people, they get triggered when they hear the word even. Um, How does, do you see that come across in your practice that perhaps maybe they're not ready to go there or they've just got so much trauma or something's triggering them around that whole notion? And how are you able to work with them and around that? Absolutely. I see that a lot, actually. You know, um, unfortunately, in the name of God, they many times people have been abused and, you know, used or whatever. So um, therefore, I don't blame them for having a distorted kind of relationship or no relationship at mm-hmm. all. So I come at them from the scientific perspective. I utilize words like conscious mind, subconscious mind, because that feels like it's part of yourself. It's mm-hmm. not something that somebody else gave you, not something that you read in a book. Um, and so they can wrap their head around that a little bit more to those that come to me with the notion of religion. And they're like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a Christian and I believe in God. Then I'll give them those terminologies. But really, we're talking about the same thing. You know, um, you call it God. Somebody else might call it the subconscious mind. You call it like, you know, I have fears. Somebody else might call it, you know, the conscious mind is taking over or or Satan is taking over. It's really the same thing. It's just coming out different languages, different words. That's why I said words matter, because some people are triggered by one word, but you give them a different word, even though it's the exact same thing, they can embrace that. And at the end of the day, it's about just connecting back to yourself and taking you to where you need to be so you can be healed to make your life successful. I'll call it whatever I got to call it for you. For me, it might be something else. But for you, I'll I'll name it whatever you need it to be, which is why when people come to me and 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 I say, do you, are you a believer that there is something above and beyond you that helps? Even Mm -hmm. if it's not called God, even if it's something else, right? You call it whatever you got to call it. Can you connect to that? Because if they can connect to that, then I can take them there. But if they're like, nope, absolutely not. It's just me and my mind. I may go through the subconscious and the conscious mind verbiage, but they need to be able to relax into the theta brain waves or the meditative brain waves for me to actually penetrate a little bit, um, even to their trauma so I can pull all that information out. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. I'm not for everyone. So it's really at the end of the day with a psychologist or a therapist, it's not your training or any of those things. It's how well that person can connect with you and your heart. Because it is a spiritual experience, even if they don't know that. Yeah, that's uh, that's very profound. I've never really thought of it that way. But when you say it, Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. And I definitely get that connection with my clients. I've had that connection with my therapist. So it's, it's true because you're kind of going on this journey together and you're almost, there is an aspect of faith. There's an aspect of trust that you're putting in this person that, you know, wherever this person guiding me, <clears throat> it's going to take me to somewhere that's going to be beneficial for me. So I, I can definitely see that, but there is faith for sure and it's like any relationship you start that you almost need to have that faith that this person is going to be working in my best interest or i can trust this person and that alone is a sign of faith as much as people don't like to claim that they don't believe in faith or or that but there's faith everywhere you know even right in a weird way you have to surrender to me first right for me to guide you there you have to trust me first And have faith that I know what I'm talking about to guide you there. And at the end, God willing, again, I say God and people freak out, you know, whatever. But hopefully I can transfer that trust back to you where you can do it for yourself. And when people work with me, they all tell you, I give homework. And part of that homework is those those practices of those things. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to be with you all the time. After that, you need to know what to do on your own. And really what I'm doing is I'm really hoping to introduce you to you. 
And when I introduce you to you, that you keep that relationship going. Yeah. 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 And I mean, the practices all tie back, right? Whether you call it under Eastern philosophy, you kind of look at it under religion or, or even some of the, the stuff we're seeing now in the West, it, it all ties back to the same concept, right? Whether it's having gratitude, setting an intention, you know, having affirmations, the, the whole idea is the same. It's just under different words, like you said, and, and words mean different things to different people. Absolutely. I like to think of myself as a light bearer, right? My name is Zoha and it means that the, the, the light that brings you out of darkness. Um, I shine the light, show you it's nothing scary there, and then allow you to enter in. What you do in there is on your own. I don't need to be in your space anymore, right? But some people are even scared to enter in because they don't know what's happening and fear stops them. And all fear is, is inverted faith. So really, once you un untangle that and, and, and hand it over to them, you're really just taking them back home. You're taking them back to their heart, to their, who they are, and allowing them to just have that experience from that moment forward. Sometimes when we hit a wall again, you know where to find me. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully you can do it on your own and keep that going. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's amazing. And thank you, Dr. Fazel, for coming on here and sharing your story and guiding us through the work you do. I think it's so valuable and I appreciate, you know, how honest you are and, um, and, you know, I love how you've approached all of this. I think it's really inspiring for someone like myself, who's starting on that journey of becoming or starting as a therapist too. And I, definitely see a lot of value in there but uh for listeners that are interested in the work you do or want to get a hold of you what are some ways they can do that well first of all thank you for having me back on your show and allowing me this platform to be with you and you know if i'm inspired anyone thank you i, I appreciate that and you know like i said it's not me that's doing the work it's someone above me yeah. Um, mm -hmm. As far as reaching me, they can reach me through my website, which is just my name, www.drzoha.com. Um, or I'm on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I'm all over the place. The funny thing is, is before I really started to dive back in, I, don't, I didn't know social media at all. And mm -hmm. I'm amazed at how much social media has grown. And, you know, and, I've, and, and now I've grown with it because it helps you attack, you know, see people that you would never know about even in other countries so i'm on instagram as dr zoha fazel just like my name um and all of my social platforms are the same name so dr zoha fazel on all of them um even my email is that so <laughs> you can find me if you really do search and it's not like my name is a typical name so you can if you find the one that's probably the one Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I'll put, I'll put all of that in the show notes for sure. So thank you for sharing that. And yeah, thank you once again for coming on here. This was a great uh, episode and it really allowed us to talk a little bit about Sufism. Obviously, we both acknowledge that it's very complicated, has many layers. And uh, sometimes it's hard to understand some of these things because there is so much going on right if you even think about having this direct connection with source it's hard to explain <laughs> and everyone exactly and different. and there's a really good book if anyone is interested in um you know kind of understanding uh, sufism a little bit more it's called heart soul i'm sorry heart self and soul um and it was written by an american man who um was a professor in Northern California, happens to have the same sort of experience I talked about with my teacher. Somebody just comes into the university to speak. He happened to be a Sufi master and he fell in love in, in, a, in a, basically that's what happened. It's like his heart connected with him. And that's how he went down the journey. But he explains um, what Sufism kind of looks like and what, what it means through this book. So it might be a nice book if anyone is interested in knowing more and kind of wants to dive into it. I, I've actually read that book many times over and over because it means different things at different times. Mm -hmm. So, but of course, Rumi is the guide. So 
if you're into Ruby, he will guide you on a, I mean, he'll basically, in essence, there's many times when he says, you know, people are searching for you everywhere. They say your name, they say your name, and little do they know, like, what are they talking about? You've been here the whole time, I, right? Yeah, it's really cool. the self. So, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> great. Thank you again. Thank you for tuning into this episode with Dr. Fazel. As always, please leave a review or a comment in the comment section. I always love hearing from you. And please subscribe to the podcast if you already haven't done so. That's the best way to support this podcast. Thank you again, and until next week.